Well, hello. Welcome once again to Stuff and Things, where I like to talk about stuffs and occasionally even things. I'm your good friend Bradley, and today is a very pleasant Sunday stuff and things. And on this very pleasant Sunday stuff and things, we will be talking about various things and stuff. Things like a reading from the Eye of Argon, the science fiction slash fantasy masterpiece by Jim Thies. We will de be talking a little bit about how everybody's doing. I just kind of wanted to check in with you. You can check in with me. I'll be telling you about some, you know, minor bits of news in my life. Just, just rapping, man, just talking to each other. We're going to be talking about some videos that we have upcoming on the channel in the various categories that I post in. I will give you a kind of odd anecdote that happened to me recently that you may find amusing. I'm not sure. And then of course we will round everything out with some questions from hashtag ask stuff and things. That is where I get questions from you and I attempt to answer them on the show. But as I mentioned, the show would not be complete without a reading from the Eye of Argon. By Jim when last we left Grigner, Broig and his compatriot were trying to grab Grigner and bring him someplace. Grigner had armed himself with like the bones from a dead rat that he had killed. Um, it seems like a very long chapter. In fact, I don't know that we'll even get to the end of this chapter in this episode. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, that's very long. Uh, but Grigner is mid escape attempt right now. So let's get back here. Let's see what's going to happen here. Before the sentry could wrench his axe free from his comrade's carcass, he found Grigner's massive hands clasped about his throat, choking the life from his clamped lungs. With a zealous grunt, the accordion flexed his tightly corded biceps, forcing the grim-faced soldier to one knee. The sentry plunged his right fist into Grigner's face, digging his grimy nails into the barbarian's flesh. Ejaculating a curse through rasping teeth, Grigner surged the bulk of his weight forward, bowing the besieged soldier over upon his back. The sentry's arms collapsed to his thigh, shuddering convulsively, his bulging eyes staring blindly from a bloated, cherry-red face. Rising to his feet, Grigner shook the blood from his eyes, ruffling his surly red mane as a brush fire swaying to the nighttime breeze. Stooping over the spr... spr Stooping over the spr sprawled corpse of the first soldier, Grigner retrieved a small white object from a pool of congealing gore. Snorting a gusty billow of, more, of mirth, he once more concealed the e-tiny object beneath his loincloth, the tediously honed pelvis bone of the broken rodent. Returning his attention toward the second soldier, Grigner turned to the task of attiring his limbs. To move about freely through the dim recesses of the castle would require the grotesque garb of its soldiery. Okay, he's putting on the soldier's uniform. Utilizing the silence and stealth acquired in the untamed climbs of his childhood, Grigner slink through twisting corridors and winding stairways, lighting his way with the confiscated torch of his dispatch guardian. Knowing where his steps were leading to, Grigner... Knowing where his steps were leading to? Grigner meandered aimlessly in search of an exit from the chateau's dim confines. The wild blood coursing through his veins yearned for the undefiled freedom of the livid wilderness lands. Coming upon a fork in the passage, he trekked, no, he treaked, voices accompanied by clinking footfall, footfalls discerned to his sensitive ears from the left corridor. Wishing to avoid contact, Grigner veered to the right passageway. If aquested, if aquested as to the purpose of his presence, his barbarous accent would reveal his identity, being that his attire was not that of the castle's mercenary troops. He just said that he put on the soldier's uniform. In grim silence, Grigner treaded down the dingily, the dingily lit corridor, a stalking panther creeping warily along on padded feet. After, in, after an interminable period of wandering through the dull corridors, the spelling here is just... No gap to break the monotony of the cold gray walls, Grigner espied a small winding stairway. Descending the flight of arced granite slabs to their posterior, Grigner was confronted by a short hallway leading to a tall arched wooden doorway. And we'll do one more paragraph, gang. Halting before the teeming portal portal, Grigner restes his shaggy head sideways against the barrier. 
Detecting no sound from within, he grasped the looped metal handle of the door, his arms surging with a tremendous effort of bulging muscles. Yet the door would not budge. Retrieving his axe from where he had sheathed it beneath his girdle, he hefted it in his mighty hands with an apisid, with an apisid grunt, and wedging one of its blackened edges into the crack between the portal and its iron rim sill, bracing his sandaled right foot against the ruggedly hewn wall, teeth tightly clenched, Grigner apolevered the broken haft, employing it as a lever whereby to pry open the barrier. The leather-wound hilt bending to its utmost limits of endurance, the massive portal swung open with a grating of snapped latched and rusty iron hinges. It would appear that Grigner is about to make his escape. All right, gang, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I want to take this opportunity to now just to check in with you. How are you all doing? We are living in very weird times right now, and you sort of take for granted, or you used to take for granted, the normalcy of your life. Well, okay, I'll only speak for myself. I used to take for granted the normalcy of my life, and now when you walk around and try to go about your day, at least here, uh, pretty much everyone I meet has their face occluded by a mask, it's kind of surreal and kind of weird, but we just sort of take it as normal now. Um, but I know that a lot of people have some strains and some stresses, things with work and just everything going on. So I'm curious if you want to leave a little note in the comments below, I would love to hear from all of you and just know how you've been doing with all of this nonsense going on lately. As for me and my fiance, um, we're doing fine. I'm still working all the time. We've been very busy at work. If you don't know, I do construction work, concrete, um, we have had a lot of work, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And, uh, you know, I was complaining about the heat recently, primarily because I have to work outside uh, in the sun and the heat. And also this new building that we had moved into, my old place was, I don't know, it was breezy. I had a nice corner unit and I got a nice breeze coming through all the time off the water. So it never got too hot in the summer. But one of the issues with the new place that we moved into is that there's just no airflow at all. And so when I was complaining about the heat and you were all making fun of me about the heat because it was only in the 80s and you're all in like 100 degrees or whatever, the issue is is that no one has air conditioning in the Pacific Northwest pretty much. We definitely don't. We don't have any good airflow. We don't really have any way to circulate the air in the apartment. And so when I would be in my office editing or doing things, it was literally, I think it got up to 88 degrees in my office. And so this is just, you're, you're trying to relax, you're trying to rest, you're trying to do some work, and it's 88 degrees. <clears throat> and I'm sitting there in my underwear, just sweating, stuck to my chair. It's kind of annoying. And it would last, you know, till 10 o'clock at night because it would get cooler outside, but it would still be, you know, 10 to 12 degrees hotter inside. So that, that was annoying. It's actually cooled down a little bit lately. It's only in the 70s now, so that is much more toler tolerable both for work and for being at home and trying to relax. Um, other news, we, I, or I had talked about my fiance and I trying to plan a trip this year and I was asking for advice from some of you and many of you gave us really good tips on places we should try out. I had mentioned maybe wanting to go to Texas or the Galveston area because that's where my little brother and his family lives. Um, we got a lot of good responses from you and we may eventually pursue some of those later, but we've decided that for this year, it's just not gonna work. We're not gonna push it. We're not gonna try to fly. We're not gonna try to do any sort of extended trip this year. It's just too uncertain and too weird. And we don't wanna take the time and spend the money to go someplace and then not be able to fully experience that place because of restrictions or shutdowns or things like that. So what we've decided for now is that I think we may take like a weekend getaway trip, maybe a three or four day weekend um, in September, just go down the coast, someplace we can drive to and that would be, I don't know, just low impact vacation kind of thing just for a few days. But we have made a decision. And I don't know how wise this was, but we had to go for it. We found an amazing deal on airfare to Japan for next year. And so we went ahead and bought two tickets. We're gonna be going, hopefully, eh, hopefully we'll be going next March to Japan for a good week and a half. So 
that's something to look forward to. It's definitely something I'm looking forward to. Hopefully, if the world gets back to some sort of sense of normalcy by next March, we will be going to Japan, and of course, we will be taking you with us. And I will show you as much as I can doing vlogs and things like that. So I guess in the coming months, first of all, I need to refresh my Japanese. Second, I'd love to hear from all of you if you have suggestions for places to go. We kind of want to go, we'll probably be, well, we're definitely flying into Tokyo, and then we were thinking of immediately taking a train to Kyoto and staying in that area for a few days. And because I want to experience Kyoto and some of the surrounding areas and then probably ending the trip back in Tokyo. We'll come back to the Tokyo area, stay there for a few days. So if you guys have any suggestions uh, of places to visit, I'd love to hear. It was basically just too good to pass up the deal on the airfare. It was basically, I said basically a lot. It was pretty much the price of going to New York, but that's flying to Japan for that price. It's actually, I've actually paid more to go to New York when I went to New York than I paid for my ticket to go to Japan. So not bad. But anyway, yeah, I would love to hear your advice. Uh, was there anything else weird going on with me? I'm reading this. Oh yeah, my little brother and his family are actually gonna be visiting from Texas here in the Pacific Northwest. They took a little road trip, or actually a very large road trip. It took them about a week to drive from Houston. Now they're here in Bellingham and I'm looking forward to hanging out with him, seeing my niece my little niece. Uh, so yeah, that's what's been going on with me. What's going on with you? Next, upcoming videos that you can look forward to on the channels. First of all, on Stuff and Things, there will be a review of John Cotton's Double Pressed Virginia posting this Wednesday. I just recorded this review. In fact, I have some in my Savinelli Corallo di Mare right now. And just as a little preview, if you watched the first impressions video last week, you will know that I was uh, very optimistic about this blend. I thought it seemed pretty damn good. The, the sentiment hasn't really changed. I think that this is a really good Virginia blend. And in fact, it's very reminiscent to me of one of my all time favorite straight Virginia blends. I'm not going to give that away yet. You probably already know it. I think I might have mentioned it in the uh, first impressions video. But watch this review on Wednesday um, to get my full thoughts on this blend. It was quite good, and I quite enjoyed it. Next, the Bloodborne series is continuing on Stuff and Things Plays. I'm about to sneeze. it went away. The Bloodborne series is continuing on Stuff and Things Plays. I'm having so much fun with that game, and I think it's one of the best series we've done in a while, uh, just because the game is so good, and there are so many fun, emergent things that have been happening with the gameplay. I posted a video last week, I think it was the video, the, the most recent one on Friday, where just this crazy sequence of events happened where, like, Kevin, the, the character that I'm playing as, just like did this crazy last minute dodge and then ended up in a big mosh pit filled with enemies and just all sorts of crazy things are going on. It's really fun. I suggest you check it out. New videos post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific. And then also, oh man, I just made a mess. Just made a big mess. Also on the guitar front, as I mentioned, you guys asked for it and now you're getting it. I'm posting guitar videos. I have had the opportunity to procure some guitar pedals. Uh, it was basically a deal I couldn't pass up. I had reached out to uh, a maker, a manufacturer, and they gave me an amazing deal on two very cool pedals, and I'm really looking forward to getting them. They're coming from Greece, though, so that might be a hint as to the manufacturer. So I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to take for them to get here, but once they do, I'm going to be doing for sure a box opening because um, I'm so excited about these and I think that the way they're gonna be packaged and everything is gonna make it worth doing a box opening. And then I will do indiv individual videos on both of the pedals or maybe do like a first impressions video. I'm not sure, but I'm really excited and I really think you guys are gonna enjoy these videos as well. Uh, so check those out. I'm not sure exactly when those will start posting because I haven't received them yet. Uh, the videos yet, not the videos, the pedals yet but I will keep you updated on that. And then also, I had had 
kind of a weird guitar playing breakthrough recently. Very briefly, and I'm not going to get into this too deeply because when I do a video on it, that's the place for getting into it. But I first started learning how to play guitar when I was like 15 or 16. I had a crappy acoustic at first, and then I got a crappy electric, and I just tried to play like Nirvana songs and things. Off and on, I had touched guitar, but hadn't ever really buckled down and learned too much other than, you know, open chords, bar chords, trying to learn songs and stuff. Always enjoyed it, but never really, really dedicated myself to doing like solo playing or scales. I think scales, what are scales? I don't need scales. But very recently, I decided, since I've had my little guitar awakening again, that I thought, you know what, maybe it'd be a good idea to learn some scales. And a whole world has opened up to me that I, I guess I knew existed, but I didn't, I had never really experienced it. And I'm really looking forward to making a video about this and sharing it with you. I just don't know exactly what it will be about yet. It's, it's hard to... I guess I need to kind of explore this, this revelation a little bit more, but look forward to kind of a, eh, a general guitar video where I just talk about um, my experience learning guitar and, and trying to reconnect with it recently and the things that have really kind of opened it up for me. That will be coming up within the next couple months as well. So. This last week, we were doing some work out on Lummy Island, which is an island near here. Uh, you have to take the ferry. It's a very short ferry ride, very tiny little ferry. Um, and the island has a population of, I don't know, maybe 600 people or something. It's very small. Uh, cool, nice little place, really nice scenery and everything. But we've done work there before. And last week, I was waiting for the ferry in the morning and the ferry arrived, it docked, the cars on the ferry left the ferry, and then our line, we were lined up to get onto the ferry, should have been going, but it wasn't moving. I was like, what's going on? Why isn't, why isn't this line of cars moving? What's going on? Like craning my neck, trying to see ahead. What, what's happening? What's happening? Finally, the person in front of me signaled that they wanted to try to back up, and so I made as much room as I could. They backed up they turned and passed the car that was in front. It was like a minivan that was the first car in line. It wasn't moving. They went around this car, like, okay, maybe the car broke down or something, and they're just telling people that they should just go on, be, go on by and get on the ferry. I pull out myself, start driving by this minivan. I look over to my right to see into the passenger seat of this minivan, and sitting in the passenger seat, is a golden retriever and the golden retriever as i pass looks over at me with its tongue sort of lolling out and that like doofusy smiling face that golden retrievers has and just kind of smiles at me in the passenger seat are two pomeranians they're both sitting they're they're like standing on the passenger seat with their paws up on the dashboard like looking out like come on let's go let's go Golden Retriever driving the car. Well, not driving the car, but sitting in the car in the driver's seat. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what happened, uh, but that was hilarious. And I found it very funny. I unfortunately did not get a picture of it because I was, I was like driving by and then suddenly see this, the driver of the vehicle was a Golden Retriever and its two passengers were two Pomeranians. So unfortunately I didn't get a picture. I just had to go onto the ferry. I think that vehicle ended up on the ferry but I'm not sure who was driving it. All right, gang, it is time for your questions in a little segment I like to call hashtag ask stuff and things. If you have a question for me and you would like it answered on the Sunday stuff and things, tweet at SAT Bradley with the hashtag ask stuff and things, and I will do my best to answer your question on the next Sunday stuff and things. Also, if you are a Patreon supporter, you can write to me there. I also will try to grab a comment or a question from YouTube comments every once in a while. It's a little more difficult to do that. But anyway, you have various ways to get in touch with me. So the first question comes via Patreon. It is from a good newer Patreon named John Leone, or it's, I don't know if it's uh, Leone. 
I'm going to say, John. Uh, hey, Bradley, how's it going? Most of the blends I have are based on your reviews, and I really enjoy them. However, with Bengal slices that lots of people love, leaves me with a taste of artificial sweetness. Am I crazy? I know taste is subjective, but wow. I will keep smoking it to give it a try, but did you taste that as well? I watched your reviews and didn't hear you say anything about that, but it was really prominent to me. What say you, my good man? John. Thank you for the question, John, and thank you for the, for the support on Patreon. Bengal slices. <clears throat> I reviewed that like probably two years ago now, and I vaguely remember it. I think it was flavored with something. It was like a licorice or anise flavoring, I believe. So maybe that's what you're detecting. There is a topping in Bengal slices, and I definitely noticed the topping. I didn't notice like a really chemically or artificial, artificial kind of sweetness, but I definitely noticed there was probably some extra sweetness imparted because of that anise or licorice-like topping. So maybe that's what you're noticing there. Next, from David A. Gadro, or Gad... Oh, I'm so horrible with these names. Uh, Gadru? Got a question for you. When you are smoking your pipe and give it a tamp, do you pour out the ash or leave it in the bowl? Regards... Oh yeah, this is David. <coughs> kind of frog in my throat lately. Our, our good friend Mr. Luxurious from Luxurious Bastard Beard Company. Uh, he made some awesome beard oil for me. He gave me a great pipe. I love that little Costello that he sent. David. David, thank you so much. Um, I do not tip out ash. So he's asking, you're enjoying your pipe. It burns down a ways. You get a little bit of ash on the top. You're always tamping your pipe down. So you get a little disc of um, kind of charred on the top, but then there will be, the disc will be there and then there'll be a line of just ash there and then the unburnt stuff there. I typically don't tip out the unburnt stuff. You can see here, Eh, there's stuff in there. It doesn't usually even tip out for me because it's usually fairly compacted. Um, by the time I'm down at the end of the bowl, I'm still able to tamp it down. I, I guess I don't find that there is a ton of ash in the bowl. Typically when I'm done, there will be a little bit, but there's not a ton and I never feel the need to tip it out while I'm smoking. I know some people do. It depends on the blend, obviously, and on the pipe and everything, but typically I don't tip it out. But thank you, David, for being a Patreon supporter for all the amazing things you've done in the past and for this question. Next, from Check Engine, our good friend Gus. Here is my problem with my pipe. I get the pipe stuffed, and then when I try it, I wind up losing bulk in the bowl. That is, I tamp down, and it goes down quite a bit, volume of uh, the tea in the bowl. I tried everything I could think of, from packing more tightly to the Frank method, but I never can get it consistent from bowl to bowl. Help! Please answer on your next video. Thanks, Gus. Well, thank you, Gus. Um, so basically you're saying you, you fill your bowl, you tamp it, and then when you light it, so is this when you, after you've lit it or once you've been smoking it? Yeah, so it's once you've been smoking it a bit, you tamp it down, it goes down quite a bit. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. As long as the draw that you're getting feels right. If it feels too loose or if it feels too open, then maybe you don't have enough in the bowl and you need to tamp it down more initially and put more in. Um, but if it feels right and it smokes okay, then that's fine. I don't, I don't know what the issue is necessarily. Um, if you pack it too tightly, so, it's so densely in the bowl that when you try to tamp it down, it hardly moves, then you're probably having trouble with your draw. So you just want to balance the amount that you put in and how tightly you pack it with the kind of draw you're getting. Thank you for the question, Gus. Next, from Cody, okay. Cody Strigler, Strigler. Uh, we, we're getting corrections on how I pronounce Cody's name in the last, uh, I think it was the last episode. Cody says, wrong again. Ha ha, I didn't realize the difficulty. The I is lowercase and the E is silent. So is he saying Strigler? It's spelled S-T-R-I-E-G-L-E-R, -E -E which to me looks like Strigler, but he says Strigler. Look forward to hearing the pronunciation again. 
Cody. Is he Strigler? The Zogan Strigler? Falsch. Ihr Name wird Strigler. Ausgesprochen. Next, from Twitter, from Turf Smurf at BS Smurf 1974. Hey Bradley, I got the chance of a high end estate pipe at a good price, and I'm unsure whether to go ahead and buy it. The equivalent pipe new is about the same price, so is it better to get an estate or a new pipe? Well, that's kind of interesting. If the used pipe is the same price as a brand new one, if it's not a super vintage, super desirable pipe, then I would probably go for the new one because you don't know what kind of nasty shenanigans have gone on with the estate pipe. If I get an estate pipe, I do a very deep cleaning of it and try to just make sure that no DNA is left on it whatsoever. But if it's, if it's a modern pipe and the one you're getting is still being made in exactly the same way and the new version is as good as or is the same price as the estate one or the used one i'd probably get the new version there's something to be said maybe for having a pipe that's pre-broken in but that's also assuming that the person who broke the pipe in did it correctly and didn't smoke it weirdly um so maybe a little bit more information for next time if you could tell me the pipe and the year of the estate pipe and the year of the new one and the relative prices but to me it seems like if it's a nice pipe and it's a current pipe, and you can get a new one for the same price, I'd go for the new one. Next, from Tyler Brubaker, at Tyler Brubaker 20. Hey Bradley, it's been a while since my last tweet. I've been pretty busy, LOL. But I was curious as to what's your favorite straight Virginia blend. Thanks. Uh, no worries, Tyler, you write all the time, and you are great. My favorite straight Virginia, mm, I really love Samuel Gawith, uh, Full Virginia, or Full Virginia Flake, but that's, pretty much impossible to get recently. I don't think I've seen it online forever. Uh, and then I really enjoy Dunhill Flake quite a bit as a straight Virginia. Those are the two that are really popping up off the top of my head, but I'm sure a lot of other people will have some great suggestions in the comments below. But gang, it is now that time. The best part of the show where we thank our Patreon supporters. And we actually have a couple new $25 supporters. Hey, hey ah, ha, ha. I was getting a little worried there actually for a while. Uh, but thank you all so much. The people who support the Patreon are heroes. You are kings and queens among men and women, and I couldn't do it without you. It means a lot, and it helps a lot. If you would like to support the shows, you can go to the description box below. There is a link to the Stuff and Things Patreon. But for now, I would like to thank those who support the channel at $25 or more a month. People like Ryan McFadden, MD of the North, Kirk Crompton, Private Eye, Cody Striegler, Ist Striegler, Ryan Stoffer, Corbin Borbin, Glenn, and welcoming David you're, David, you're gonna have to tell me now how to pronounce your name properly. As you can tell, I can pronounce German names perfectly, but French names, not that great. David Gaudru, I think. And then Gus, our good friend Gus, AKA Check Engine, AKA I Love Gongs. And then the maniac tier, the crazy maniacal weirdos who support the channel at $100 a month. People like our amazing friend, Peter Straub, and our wonderful, stolid, perfect person. Bob McGee. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you all for watching and for leaving comments and sending in your questions to hashtag AskStuffAndThings. I really appreciate it. Please watch the review of John Cotton's Double Press Virginia coming up this week. Watch the Bloodborne series every Monday, Wednesday, Friday on Stuff and Things Plays. Stay tuned for more guitar videos, more pedal videos, more blend videos, all sorts of videos, a lot of the videos, lots of videos coming up all the time. But until next time, until we meet again, I've been your good friend, Bradley. You've been the audience. This has been Stuff and Things on a pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things. I'll see you later. <laughs>